you're ready, just give it a rip. Pull, pull, pull. There you go. Done. Holy fuck. <laughs> Mr. Mark Amick, awesome. welcome back. Great to see you, brother. Anatomy Tuesdays, back in action. <laughs> Hopefully a little improved with our uh, setup and knowledge here. I think so, I think so. I think we've grown a little bit since then. <laughs> Yeah, we got, uh, <laughs> I went back and watched one of those videos I was in and I was telling them, I showed up a little late, about an hour and a half late to our session today. Um, and I was in a rabbit hole yesterday and part of that rabbit hole was an Anatomy Tuesday review of okay. where we were at. <laughs> and. Oof yeah. Oof we I, might have, I, we might have to delete some of that stuff. I think we probably should. It'd probably be better. <laughs> Get that off the yeah, internet. Yeah. Scrub that um, off the internet. Yeah, I, that was a lot of uh, old school. What were you? Big. Um, let's see. Kelly Starrett and uh, who was the other guy? Speaking of Kelly Starrett, though, I got a I got a message from him. He was mad at me yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Getting in some beef. Get it, not not real beef. I told. I didn't mean, I wasn't trying to call this stuff out yesterday. We've messaged back and forth a couple times, but now I got to do a video addressing Kelly Starrett. So that's a little <laughs> teaser for, for that video. But uh, no, too funny. I, I was making fun of people that do a couch stretch like once a week and then complain about like having tight hips. Yep. And he thought I was making fun of the couch stretch itself. So nothing wrong with got, the couch stretch. Yeah, nothing wrong with the couch yeah. stretch. Nothing wrong with any of his stuff either. We just took it a little bit as gospel back in the day. And you know, it's some baseline knowledge, but that's, that's where you got to start. That's where you got to get to. And, happy with uh, with the growth we've had. And what is that growth? Where are we now? What are we doing now? Dude? Yeah, so, man, Anatomy Tuesday, I was probably in chiropractic school, so yeah. graduated chiro school, had some time as a clinician, as a coach, you know, out of school for a bit. How was and that experience? It was all right, man. It was all right. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Like, obviously, there's ways that you want to practice um, that can be challenging to just get up and running from the get-go, so kind of working with some other people and and trying to find my lane within all that was was great. Learned a ton from it, um, and ultimately led me to what I'm doing now, which has been really fun. So I got exposed to uh, a lot of great sports science, sports testing, uh, health testing systems. Uh, working for a company called Bald Performance now, and. Uh, wouldn't have had that opportunity without some of the clinical experience that I got. So, uh, yeah, loving the current role. Yeah, what was that uh, transition like? How did, how did you actually, were you like just one day working in the, like, in the clinic and be like, oh, this is kind of cool stuff, I'm more interested in this, or did you reach out to somebody? Like, how was that kind of? Yeah, so, I mean, we were a client with, with the company, which was awesome, so I got to know some people with involved pretty quickly. So they were working with uh, when you were a chiropractor? Oh, that's Correct. cool. Yeah, so uh, got to know some people through that. Um, and then ultimately just felt a little bit of the burnout, you know, as a clinician in the clinic for 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And um, I think a big piece of it was that I, you know, coming out of school felt like I was going to make this huge impact with people right away. And I think, you know, part of that is maybe it's come myself as, a, as an athlete is trying to go through my own healing journey was all in, 100% in, and then realizing sometimes when you work with people, they're not fully as invested as you are. They just want their back crack they just once want a their week. back crack, a little quick fix. Um, so just trying to navigate, you know, my investment into certain uh, people versus their investment back into me was was interesting. But uh, yeah, ultimately, I think just trying to strike a balance between a lot of the other things that were important to me outside of you know work and clinical sense and uh, being able to strike a little bit of a cleaner balance with uh, this new role and. Uh, it's been really rewarding so far. Well, I think that's one of the cool things with even, let's say specifically the force plate. Like the force plate is a beautiful balance of that rehab Cairo setting with the performance setting. Totally. You know, like it, it can be almost, it's such a great tool for, we are looking at uh, Wyman's knee um, yeah. and just looking at the asymmetries there, but it's like, you can do performance with that and help them with performance, and you can also do rehab with that, and it's kind of all tied in rather than the siloed. I think that's that's one of the best parts about sports performance or sports science, mm -hmm. the side of things, is that it can it stops the silo. It can it can sure. stop the silo a little bit if you're using the data, and it can make rehab guys more performance and performance guys a little bit more prehab rehab rather than everybody just kind of going their own yeah. direction and not communicating. Yeah, I agree with you, man. I think. At the end of the day, like what that's providing is information and what you decide to do with that information is, is kind of then up to you and there's a lot of great resources to learn how to use that information and, and apply it to your current knowledge and your ex experience and expertise. But um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's just like 
blending the art of a coach, the art of an athlete, with now a little bit more of the science-based thing. I was actually at uh, St. Thomas the other day talking to Korak, and we were talking about you know how sports science is coming in. It's so much more accessible. It's affordable. The data is easier than ever to analyze and view. Um, but at the end of the day, like humans have been running, jumping, throwing, cutting, doing all these things for thousands and thousands of years. So adding in sports science isn't necessarily going to you know, change any of that, but it is going to be some now really amazing detailed information that otherwise we wouldn't be able to see with the human eye that you can then toy with, play around with, use that to improve decision making, progress, regress in certain areas. Um, it's awesome, but I agree with you. It does kind of break down some of those silos and you're able to apply it in a lot of different situations. In the uh, time you've been with the company, have you seen any cool stories where it's like, that was actually super helpful? Like where you, it's like, oh, we had we red flagged something yeah. that really helped that athlete or something along those lines? Yeah, I think you would appreciate this one. Um, I was actually just with a client last week and they do uh, readiness jump testing every Monday. They test their entire football team and now they have a really good flagging system. So let's say you look at a metric like peak power on a counter movement jump. And so every time you test, that data is gonna be saved, stored, and you can see how they're progressing from session to session. Um, and what he noticed was like this 30% drop off from one of their star running backs um, in their peak power on a counter movement jump. And so for him, it's like, just from that information alone, you're not gonna make any decisions with that, right? But what that allows you to do is then go and have a really good conversation with the athlete to say, hey, this is, you know, data can be a nice common language between athlete, coach, parent. Um, and so he says, hey, this is the information that I saw from the plates. Your peak power output dropped off 30%, like what's going on? And the, the kid says, you know, I've been working on a ranch for the last couple weeks. I'm barely sleeping, I'm barely eating, I'm just like exhausted and, uh, but the athlete didn't really have the knowledge to say like, I shouldn't be doing these things or mm -hmm. I should be communicating this with my coach. Like I'm coming in and I'm here to work and work out. But um, they were able to flag that drop off, have a really good conversation about the athlete's stress management, his nutrition, his sleep. And, uh, and it just kind of sparked a whole new pathway for that athlete to now move forward for the rest of the season and, and have a really good idea of how he needs to be taking care of himself outside of the weight room. Yeah, Jake just had a post, he, and he was talking about tendons and ligaments versus muscles, and he was like, with muscles, don't be soft. If you're sore, it's just a don't be soft thing. Mm -hmm. Tendons and ligaments, if they're sore, mm -hmm. like, don't be dumb. Sure. And I was like, that's kind of a cool, like, lapse over there. It's like the data can give you time where it's telling you, okay, now is the day to don't be soft. Like, you're just, whatever, you're just off, yeah. and now is the day, like, okay, you actually have a 30% reduction yeah. in... Um, things going on here and we should probably actually be smart or sure. don't be dumb today and not send it. 100%, yeah. So then you just make the decision to say, all right, we're gonna pull off a little bit today. We're gonna get you some good food in your system and just let you recover a little bit. And it's crazy to see then that swing, you know, the next week testing goes back up, numbers kind of come back up to normal, but without just having some of that added information, maybe you throw that athlete back on the field and you have something catastrophic happen. You never really know. Um, but that's kind of the cool thing about investing in technology in a system like this is um, the potential of what it can do and how it can help an athlete. And one of the things I just realized I skipped over with was your own rehab story for mm -hmm. people that don't know. Um, what was that rehab journey? And then on the secondary end, I know it's like looking back at things. What do you wish like you would have had that you kind of had either knowledge of now or like access to now with the sports science stuff that would have helped with that kind of like journey? Because I'm sure like even like going through with a lot of like my uh, herniated disc type stuff, it's like I look back at some of the stuff I was doing. I was like, dude, you could have figured that out so much better. And obviously it's all knowledge pieces now that helped me through. But it was like you were doing so much dumb shit. Like. Yeah. The first day my back would feel good, I would go squat 405 and then fuck it up for two more weeks. Yeah. I'm like, dude, what were you doing? But do you have any moments like that in your own rehab journey? And what was your rehab journey like? Too? Yeah, yeah, no. So, beat up a little bit through just, you know, career as an athlete. So, football, ultimately, like, I think the two biggest things were in college. I had two knee surgeries, blew out my knee my sophomore year. ACL? ACL, MCL, meniscus, came back. Um, you did that in college, though? I thought you had it in high school and then college again. Or no, was it, it was both in college? college yes, Dang. both in college. So uh, a couple like tweaks and things that were probably underlying going into college. Yep. But, uh, you know, I had like 
a really good training staff. It worked out with like TJ and John McNulty and some of those guys back in Illinois. He was an OG, Dr. Tommy John, yes, sir. when he was in the sports yeah, performance yeah. world. And like, so the confidence level that I had training with those guys was really, really high. Um, but ultimately, like things happened in the football field. One of them was non-contact. The next one was more of a contact kind of leg whip injury. Well, I, I load management at St. Thomas was great too. Our data, <laughs> data science there was awesome. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, right? It's like you only have access to so much and that staff only had access to so much. So if I were to say like, yeah, I had two big knee injuries. Coming back from those was a lot more using pain as a currency of rehab and saying, okay, I need to, um, you know, my pain level's here, I'm gonna train, I'm gonna rehab, I'm gonna get better, stronger, faster. My pain level's going down. Functionally, I feel a little bit better. Um, but it really was like, here's your ACL return to play, protocols, phases, timelines. Um, you know, you're kind of just thrown into the, uh, the general masses, the system yep. of like, what are the phases like? Okay, six to eight months, now you're sprinting, you know, eight months, now you're cutting. And, and uh, so that was really, the, the program, right? Like trying to navigate through that, keeping pain levels down, trying to improve function, and then ultimately once you check those boxes, getting the go-ahead. Um, so I think if there was anything now learning, looking back, it's like the value of having some objective measurement just to see, like I said, the things that the human eye can't see and having a couple extra metrics or things to look at outside of just pain um, would have been incredibly helpful because Pain is a part of it. Even when I was like back in training camp junior year, I came back after like nine months, which one, probably rushed it, but two, just, you know, I got the go ahead. I got the sign off from it. But I was like blowing up every day after practices, after sessions, knee would swell up, pain was pretty high. Um, and I was told that that was all pretty normal, which was frustrating. But so I think if you look back and you said, okay, if I would have had access to technology like this or a system like this, like, I probably would not have even stepped on the field, mind you. It would have been like, all right, take a year here, we'll redshirt you, and you'll rehab, you'll get strong, you'll come back for another two, whatever it would have been. So, um, yeah, it is it is what it is, right? I think, like, at the end of the day, those types of things led me to the path that I took and what I was interested in and trying to get myself, you know, healthier and stronger. And uh, so I can't knock anything for it. It just would have been, uh, it would have been a different story to have a different process for sure. Well, and the thing nowadays too, it's like when you, what you were saying then, it's like a lot of times we, they didn't really have access to a lot of this data. Or if it, the data, like I remember force plates back in the day, dude, they were like mm -hmm. insanely expensive. Like yeah. I remember we used up almost our entire exercise science budget one year to go get those force plates yeah. and they were like shitty force plates compared to this, which are like a tenth of the cost. Yeah. But nowadays it's like, I just, I was telling uh, one of the PTs that I uh, play softball with about you and the force plates and he was telling me a horror story of a guy that's at a massive SEC um, baseball team, mm. full ride scholarship, one of their starters, and uh, having hamstring issues, tore his hamstring, came back and they just like put him on one of those timelines, right? Mm. And they're just like, yeah, you're good to go. Went back, played again, tore it again. Um, and money brought him in and like was talking to him and was uh, like, well, have you ever had this tested? Anything like that? He's like, no. And then this is, again, this is the biggest budget you'll ever have in SEC. Sure. He's never had it tested. Got it tested at um, the, the PT clinic and there was, uh, he had 40% of the strength in his right hamstring that he had in his left and the same with his quad that he had in his left. So it's like, now you have access to the data. Now you're just not using it. And I know also in the football world, it's, now it's not, so that, that school just didn't test, which is like, I can almost respect that more than a school that has the data, like these catapults, these GPS tracking units. Mm -hmm. And so then they get all the data and then they don't use it. Like, <laughs> it's like, so that I think is the balance between, just cause you have the toy, like you have to use the toy or yeah. use the information from the toy. Otherwise it does you no good. So like the first step is getting the toys. Like if you have money to get the toys, I don't see nowadays, especially if you're a million dollar sports team, why at least you're not getting these data points. As this, this is as the, I'm not a massive data guy, like not getting lost in the data guy, but you should still have something, yeah. right? Especially as your budget increases, like why are we not using that money on your athletes and, and rather than spending it elsewhere, like the cool locker rooms, like maybe let's uh, get them a fourth plate <laughs> yeah, or something, yeah, you know? Yeah. And then 
the other end of it is the football teams where it's like the head coach is presented with all this information, the sports science team's all excited about this information, and the football coach is like, oh, that's amazing, hypes them up, and then uses none of it. It doesn't change his practice at all. Yeah, yeah. and that's a big challenge too. We get that feedback from a lot of, a lot of people is like, the collaboration, once you have it, once you are making the data actionable, it's like getting the buy-in from everybody else on the staff, getting the buy-in from the sport coaches. Um, and it's just, it's just an evolution of it, right? Like, I don't think ever before the amount of data that we can get and the ease of the information and analysis of it, access to it, like it's never been this easy and convenient to get it all. Um, so at some point, you know, there's some programs, teams, organizations that do a stellar job of collaborating between every department of it and they can make the data actionable, they pull it, they make great decisions from it, um, and there's some that don't. But I think, you know, being that it's relatively new, being that sports science is still like a growing field, I have no doubt in my mind like over the next, you know, five to ten years it'll be more commonplace really good testing protocols, programs, procedures will all be put in place that ultimately like the goal is to be able to take this data, make your team better from it, but also like individualize it too and make sure like every athlete, you know, you can kind of build out a personal profile for them. You can really make good decisions just based around you know, that individual athlete too, which is exciting. Fuck yeah. Let's get moving. Cool. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. So we're going to do some force play stuff. You yeah. got some dynamometer stuff, um, but I'm going to have Mark lead us through some you're, you're the Dr. Tommy John disciple, dude. You, you're, the, you're the OG connection to Dr. Tommy John that started all my woo woo yeah, It's his man. fault whenever I get in trouble you're there. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we're going to do some force twice pulls, and I got to beat MK because MK was talking shit the whole time. So I at least got to hit 3,100. Yep. I partook in some extracurricular activities last night Sweet. and need to get warmed up a little bit today. Right, so what do we got here? That's the perfect way to do it, man. So I think. Even like off the heels of just some of the rehab injuries, like I have almost my daily deposits that I like to put in that just kind of make my body feel good, make me just like a good reset where, uh, you know, some of those daily aches and pains just kind of fade away. So yeah, TJ's spinal hygiene has always been one. So um, just three-way neck movements, three-way, uh, you know, full spine movements, and then I'll mix that in with some calf jumps. But yeah, if you want to start with just like some, uh, you know, neck flexion extension, and really like on all these movements, you're trying to just move like one individual vertebrae at a time. Full range of motion down into flexion and then you know, slowly unwinding all the way back up. Extension. And how long, how many reps are you typically hitting this a day? Are you doing it multiple times a day, one time a day, big deposits, small deposits? I'll kind of find myself in the morning doing a little bit of a, a longer one. Um, so usually like in that 10 to 15 reps, you know, every single movement. Um, some days more, some days less, some days like bulk all in one, one morning, some days scattered throughout the day, but. The spinal flow is one of the just like easiest daily sacrifices for your body you can do that I, I really believe 90% of people, it'll change 100% how they feel. Yeah. It's just like you're sitting all day, you're not moving, pieces of the body that need to be moved and you start implementing this stuff and it's crazy how many people tell you oh my god the program is magic everything you're doing is magic it's like no dude you're literally just moving it's just <laughs> like, the consistency with like you know the things that honestly like you said they should be moving every day and this is one of the things too it's like dak does a lot of the move your joints obviously they're all kind of from the same jay schrader like yeah. background but one of the things with the move your joints is kind of philosophy is it's a very small investment. It's not, I got to go, especially like an athlete that, or a client that isn't lifting a ton of weight, isn't very yeah. active. It's not, I need to go to the gym and do a hundred things today, or I need to go get jacked right away. It's like spinal flow start, yep. spinal flow walk for a lot of clients that I start with. You get them spinal flowing and walking even, even once every other day. Yep. Let's start there how much better they feel. Once an athlete feels good, once a client feels good, dude, how much more they want to do, it, it's such a cheat code. They're like, oh my God, I wanna go like try these things that I have never like felt like it can move like this. It's like, fuck yeah, like let's go, let's go deadlift then. And the thing's on top of that, but you have an athlete that's in pain, an athlete that isn't moving very good and then is intimidated by the weight room. I think a lot of times starting them off just full send is, uh, oh. 
kind of a recipe for disaster because they're going to burn out. Whether it's physiological, they're just unprepared. But I think you can kind of regress progress. But I think a lot of it's the psychological of getting them cooking again and getting them moving. 100%. Yeah, there's nothing overly sexy about it. It's just consistency with this. But yeah, I think even with myself, like these are when I find myself starting to like really creep back back into the pain cave or, you know, I start to get more symptomatic in, you know, my knee or my low back, these things, it's like, if I can get out, if I can walk, if I can do my spinal hygiene, some calf jumps, if I can hang, like, it kind of just will dull, just get me back to baseline almost. And then I feel like I'm ready to go take on the things that I really like to do. But um, yeah, man, I think if two of my favorite one of them is more recent, one of them is old school, but I texted you about it. But like your podcast with TJ, spine, you know, hand, shoulders, feet, hips, attacking those things, like you said, will, will be your foundation and cover so many of those things. And then your uh, YouTube video on low back pain. I think like if there's an athlete starting out looking to just kind of get out of the pain cave or where should I start if I'm not fully into a training program yet it's a good foundational piece to start with it's neck got a little uh softball the neck one is so beautiful because softball is all yes. like snap in one direction you just get a little bit of movement in there dude you feel like a new person we're going side to side side bends here side bends yep, yep. anything okay. you're focusing on with these side bends that a lot of people you kind of see mess up or I like to just think about like lengthening as much as you can through the spine here. And then I try to keep my hips as square as I can too. So as opposed to like the big hip push down, like I want to feel like my low back and thoracic are really getting a lot of that, you know, side bend as well. What is your, cause you went through the whole chiropractic game. Yeah. What's your thoughts on like the whole anti-spine movement. Now, I know McGill's kind of changed his stance on some things, but like the McGill, like why do you think that's so popular? Why do you think that's so pushed? And what would be either your pushback or your compromise with that kind of thought process and way of thinking with the spine? Yeah, it's, I think because it's so common and it can be so debilitating at times that, you know, we probably got into the narrative and got pushed a little hard around like, if we're in pain, if it's debilitating, then what can we do to protect it? And I think we look at low back pain and we look at the movements and things that sometimes cause us pain or put a little added stress in the body. It's like we've just been taught to avoid those things, um, which is just not the case. I think like, you know, if you look at the best athletes in the world, the best movers in the world, the people that are probably in the lowest amount of pain, it's probably the people that put the most stress or the most, uh, can put the most movement into their spine um, and ultimately you know your spine is designed to move it's built to move it's really strong it's really stable um, so at this point now like I can respect the fact that and empathize with people that are in a lot of low back pain and they don't want to expose their back to these kinds of movements because if you do too much too soon like most people are gonna have a lot of symptoms from it right so I think now it's like the sliding scale of like how do you progress ultimately to the point where even something like spinal hygiene is not gonna flare up your back the next day, right? So um, it's just kind of those progressions and regressions around like, you wanna get movement, you wanna get more movement. You just have to almost think about like, what's your, what's your limiting factor when you start? Like some people can't even bend down and tie their shoes. So I'm probably not gonna have them do like a full, you know, Jefferson curl type of movement. Yep. But if you can sit on a bench and you can just bend over and touch your toe, and do 10 reps of that, right? It's like, how can you scale things back enough where you can do it, you can feel confident in it, it's not gonna flare your back up too much. And then, unfortunately, it is just kind of a slow process to build it back up, right? But um, I think ultimately, at the end of the day, you're hoping that people can get to the point where they feel like confident, pain-free movement, pain-free range of motion, um, and bending their back the way it's supposed to bend, right? Well, and I think that's one of the, the things with the, the spinal movements is like, so many athletes have so many stories told to themselves, and I think that's a huge part of the pain process is the story you tell yourself around pain. One of the really cool posts I saw, PT was talking about how the body's so amazing at learning that it can learn to stay in pain. And like the body's super advanced, it's like, oh, I got hurt in flexion, 
body learns that specific part of flexion is bad, so it's gonna lo it'll lock you up. Whether it's um, physiological pain or not, like whether you actually have something wrong or not, it learns flexion bad, f loaded flexion bad. Yep. And getting athletes out of that story, getting the athletes out of that learned kind of thought process, and for me it looks like, and I'd like to know your thoughts on this too, it's like, for me, <laughs> a lot of it's just like exposure therapy. Sure. It's like, yeah. I posted those, uh, uh, happy baby rolls yesterday and it's literally just grab your feet and you roll but I think this is one of the best parts about like just doing like slow-mo rolls too it's like athletes don't think that's a flex based position they think I'm rolling right yeah. then I show them how much their spine is segmented and how much they've gotten into that curl ball position that's the same as picking something up off the ground or tying their shoe where they're all bent over like that but now they're on the ground in a regress kind of fashion sure. and it's not Oh, I'm bending over. Yeah. I'm I'm rolling, you yeah. know, and getting them out of that that story of flexion is bad, right? And again, sometimes it is physiological. Sometimes it's just their body's unable to handle the demands of sport or life where they are, they they, they physiologically are not strong enough to get into a flex position under 400 pounds of a deadlift, right? But we can build that back up rather than avoid all flexion because I think that's the fairy tale a lot of people get stuck in. It's like. Flexion is bad, so just avoid it. It's like, just because you avoid it in the gym does not mean you're avoiding it in life. Like, you can't. You can't. Yeah. You're going to slip on ice. You're going to fall into flexion. You're going to pick up a piece of grocery. You're going to pick up your kid. Like, I, 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 to me, like, the, the avoided technique, it's like, you can't. It, it's, it's a fairy tale we have kind of invented that just because you're not doing it in the gym means you're going to... It's not real. Like you're gonna find yourself in these positions yeah. because the body moves into these positions, and you're never going to like pick up. And if you are, like that, that's a failure in your rehab program sure. that you have to like actively think about these things. To me, it's like regress to the point in which your flexion is literally maybe just this right here, or maybe it's not even touching ground, but it's touching your knees, and we come back up to right. the point where we don't have to think about flexion is bad. Again, I feel like that's a failure in the exposure therapy kind of way of doing things of like, you just haven't exposed your body to that stimulus at a regressed enough state in a point in which you can progress from there. Yeah. Spot on, man. Really well said. Um, I like that point around just like your brain and body is so smart that yes, if you do like if you get so used to avoiding a certain pattern or you're so fearful of it, like you're almost tricking your brain to just avoid that and find a way to compensate around it, right? Like, I think humans are just the best at compensating. And so, yeah, if you have a, a movement pattern, something you're just fearful of, if you're afraid to flex, if you're afraid to bend, um, yeah, man, it makes it really hard. It's hard to, to trick the hard wiring of your brain once it kind of catches on to that pattern. So uh, I think the gym's a perfect place to do that where now you're in a much more of a controlled environment, a safer environment, you can kind of set the standard of what that movement's gonna look like. Because to your point, you're gonna encounter it at some point in your life, and you should be able to handle the demand of whatever that is. Um, really well said. Well, that, that's one of my biggest gripes against coaches. It's like, the gym is the most controlled environment you will ever be in in life, right? Like, you control everything there. For you not to be exposing your athletes to this stuff and regressing it to a point in which they can do it, rather than fear monger, it's like, dude, they will never be in a more controlled environment ever. Like, they walk outside, they're in a, they're in a more chaotic environment yeah. than what they're doing in here, if you do it in the smart way, right? Like, the fact that we are sitting there telling them they can't pick up dumbbells off the bottom fucking rack, like Mike Boyle says, it's like, my goodness. Like, you're just creating, like, for so many athletes, you're creating more pain than you're solving with that avoidance that can be because of the story that you tell them. Yeah, yeah. Nice, man. All right, what do we got next? Um, what else do you need to warm up? You wanted to do some hangs? You want to talk about the hangs and just why you do some of your hangs yeah. for a little bit? Yeah, we're hanging. Um, yeah, man, I mean, I think I get usually like some really just one nice relief from like a low back decompression standpoint. I yep. just, like that's one of my go-tos too, along with some of the spinal hygiene stuff. Like I'm just lifestyle or you know, probably some of the patterns that I developed when I was going through some of the rehab process was like, I'm just kind of stuck with some lingering low back pain. So I've learned to self-manage and have kind of a Rolodex of things that I lean into when things do flare up, but this is always one of them. 
So love it from a low back perspective, but going back to like your podcast with TJ, you know, hand shoulders, feet hips, spine connects, like trying to just hit those things, um, regardless of really like kind of thinking too deep into it, I just can say from personal experience when I attack those things regularly, how much better my entire body feels, right? Yeah. But, um, how many sets, reps, like what are you doing with the hang? You just kind of chilling up here? Just chilling, man. I uh, Still my favorite thing when you post is till disinterested almost. Like, yeah. It is just kind of a feel. It's like at some point I'm going to get fatigued enough on my my hands, my forearms, my shoulder blades, those types of things where it's just kind of feel good enough. But uh, yeah, man. I think trying to create strength in, the, in that connection from the hands to the shoulders to the shoulder blades, like you're going to solve and feel a lot better doing those things. But uh, yeah, I think when you look at like just a lot of those extremity injuries and excess pain in those areas, all the force that you're you know encountering, whether it's with the ground, whether it's with your hands, like going up the arms, going into somewhere. So whether that's the shoulder blades, whether that's the hips, like having those parts of your body strong, stable, confident, able to handle a lot of those forces that you're gonna take on, like I feel like this is just one of those things that I can use to attack those like those areas a little bit cleaner. Well one of the things that you talked about was managing and dealing with flare-ups with lower back pain. That is something that I've, like I realize I'm at such a point in which I know, oh, your lower back's signing up, this is the prescription that you do, whatever, like, and this, it's okay. Yeah. I think that that's one of the biggest things. It's like, it's okay to have lower back pain 100%. or to have a tight low back for a day. And I think a lot of people, they don't really understand that. It's like, cause the back is scary, man. Yeah. It's like, I remember my first time having lower back pain. I was like, I'm dead, I'm yeah. done. Like I'm paralyzed, I'm over. And so many athletes, it's like, I, I think the response, one training wise, and then two, uh, if you wanna hop back up here. Um, one training wise and two lifestyle wise, it's like, as soon as that first symptom of lower back pain comes, it's, I, I'm done, I freak out, I change my entire program, I stop doing everything, I go McGill method. Yeah. And it's like, I, I think a lot of times now. it's like, for me, sometimes it's literally just like, it, it's a sore lower back, it's like a sore bicep, but you don't freak out over a sore bicep, right? It's like, my back's sore today, I'm, I'm gonna move it a little bit and then see how I feel. And a lot of times I can get over that and I think I've, I'm just at such a better state right now in not fear mongering myself around the stories that I used to tell myself with the lower back pain. It's like, oh, I'm just sore today in that yeah. lower back and I just need to move it a little bit or I did push it a little bit too much, but I'm okay. And I think that I'm okay thought process is a big deal when it comes to low back pain because I think a lot of, I think it's scary. And I think a lot of the stories we tell around it are scary. And I don't think we have enough people telling athletes that it, it's, it's okay. It's okay, it's normal. Yeah, it's um, especially when you start to ramp things up to the point where you're taking on more than you previously have, right? It's like, you know, I have my training system and the things that I do to make my body feel good, but like if I go for a, you know, eight mile hike in Arizona or if I play 36 holes of golf over a few days, like I'm expecting to have some type of flare up, but I do completely agree with you. And I think like even the patients that I still work with trying to instill confidence in exactly what you said, which is like, you're okay. Look at it more as soreness, just like any other muscle that you overwork or you train really hard. Um, and then having some type of strategy just to like, get relief in that too. Because I think a lot of people, like you said, low back pain is scary. You think you're gonna die maybe. It's like, if you have something that you can use that's gonna make you feel a little bit better, a little bit more confident that day or within that you know 24 hour period, like even that, again, gonna give you confidence, gonna make you feel better. Um, Regardless of what that thing is too. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things True. that I yeah. realize it's like, I wanna give my athletes as many tools as possible and I think that's the danger of swearing by special tools and special drills. It's like, that drill can work for a lot of people and you should use that drill with that athlete. But if it's not, it's like, okay, we need a different drill. We need something else. If it's not the spinal flow, maybe it's a side bend with a weight. Maybe it's a, maybe it is, let's say it's a bird dog. Even if it is anti McGill, you know, whatever it is, I think giving your athletes as many tools, giving your clients as many tools as you can, 
to so they know when my lower back flares up, this is a tool I use that always makes me feel better or 90% of the time makes me feel better rather than sitting with your big three. Big three didn't work for me. I, I made a post on the reverse hyper. The reverse hyper was sworn by this tool. Reverse hyper didn't work for me when I was there. The thing that worked for me was a ton of side bending and yeah. doing that and a ton of crawling and getting that like QL to move, right? Um, those were my tools, yeah. right? But I was told for so long I needed the McGill Big 3 and Reverse Hyper that I ran my head through the fucking wall and then almost like guilt tripped myself of like, not even guilt tripped myself, for me it was, I'm actually fucked up because the tools I was given that I were told fix everybody, they don't work with me so I'm actually fucked up, yeah. I'm actually damaged. And it's like, it was just a tool. Tool didn't work for me. Yep, yep. I agree, man. Even like, from like a therapy perspective, like even like from a chiropractic perspective, I always like view that too as like, it honestly didn't work a ton for me getting like hands-on manual therapy or adjustments. I never felt like it dramatically improved my low back pain. Maybe from like a passive standpoint, you know, like 24 hours, 48 hours, it gets some relief, but like ultimately it was gonna come back in a way that I needed to have tools that I could self-manage with. Um, but for some people it does. Like some people they feel great after getting some work done, some manual therapy, even just the conversation of going into a place and being able to say like, you know, get some positive encouragement, reinforcement that yep. you're not broken, this is moving well, this could just use a little bit more movement or range of motion here. Like you never know what that is gonna move the needle for a certain person. But I think, like you said, giving your athletes as many options as they you can that ultimately they can find the one that works for them is, is the key. 90% of the pain consults I do are therapy sessions. Yeah. Right. It's like, you're okay. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we'll, we'll be able to get back. And like, I give them tools and I give them everything to try and we do it. But every time the person comes back, it's like, dude, I just needed to hear that I'm not fucked up. Yeah. And it's like, it's not just me alone. And I think that's definitely one of the powers of going into a, like going to an expert, going to a chiropractor, yeah. going to somebody that is like, maybe it is placebo or not, but it's like, there is benefit in just like being told you're not totally fucked up. Yeah. And, but I think that's also one of the dangers of what a McGill can turn into, what a chiropractic setting can turn into. It's like, instead of using that time to be like, you're not broken, you're not messed up, you don't need me, but we can, you can use me. Yeah. It turns into, you do need me once a week, let's yeah. keep this going, let's like reoccurring payments, let's yeah. go. That's a tricky model, man. It's, it is, it is out there and there's people doing it and there's low quality care happening because of it and that's too bad, but uh, yeah, I think you're spot on. Like if you can just go and instill some confidence in somebody that they're not broken, they're not beat up, like you can change their entire outlook on their their body, their pain, which then ultimately is gonna dramatically enhance their life, you know? Um, I remember when I had, coming back from like knee surgeries, the process of like rehabbing, training, maybe you go from like, all right, now I'm, to the point where I can start sprinting and anytime I would feel like a tweak, a click, it would swell up a little bit, like I would get emotional and I would start to freak out and get scared about like, did I just fuck something up again? Is there like gonna be a tear in there? Like, and I would be able to go to an expert, I would go to, you know, Robert over the athletic training room and he would be able to do a lot of tests, muscle tests here and there. And he would just be like, I think you're fine. Like, everything feels good, like I wouldn't worry. And it would just, I would go from like, alarms on high, stress level on 10, emotional to just like shoulders drop, breathe, and like it would just change my week, you know? <laughs> it's, a, it's a simple thing you can do, but I, that's interesting you say that. That was a lot of my experience too. It was more of a therapy session, more of just, you can talk to somebody, give them that reassurance, sometimes that's all they need. <laughs> oh yeah, you wanna get to Poland? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So these are the beauties right here that we're working with, right? So you yes, got sir. left, right ones. Yep. Yep, so uh, two force plates, four load cells on each plate in each corner of the plate and... Uh, What's a load cell, what's that mean? Load cell is just gonna essentially tell you how much force is going into that. It's like kind of physics principles, right? So like Newton's third law of, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So you zero the plates, it takes your weight, any force that goes into those load cells is captured. Um, so the force you drive into it is then the force that's kind of generated on the back end. I mean, you got everything on this yeah. iPad here. So all Bluetooth connection, if I go in, you know, we give everybody an individual profile, we can go in, 
Force plates are an incredible tool just because it's easily the most like bang for your buck system that I think you can get out there from a testing, training standpoint, and then the ability to test upper body, lower body, isometric, dynamic movements, um, and then just the sheer amount of information you can pull from it is pretty impressive. So um, super valuable tool. We're gonna do some isometric mid-thigh pulls today. Um, so what that is is essentially stand on the force plates, pull into a bar as hard as you can into it. Again, the force that you're putting down into the plates is what it's gonna capture. And then from that, we can get a really good understanding of like our our maximum strength. Uh, we can see how each leg is working side to side, so seeing some of those asymmetries, looking at some of those more neuromuscular qualities around like our rate of force development. Um, so again, just some really unique, cool details that you can pull from, otherwise just a standard isometric like training session. Fuck yeah. All right, so you're going. Yeah. You're perfect. full sending here. Walk me through these again. Uh, these, these, these are the easy ones. Kay. These are the underneath. Okay and then just hand through. Got just like it. that. Okay. Yeah, so you don't have to wrap those. Cool. Can't really Olympic lift with them because there's no out, <laughs> but Got they're it. really good for deadlifts. Yeah, perfect. All right, so you're just picking this up, pulling as hard as evenly possible, right? That's it. And then trying uh, for how long? Like, what's the, what's the thought there? Usually like three seconds. Three seconds. Yeah, so, um, yeah, you kind of like preload into it, put a little tension on the bar. And then once you feel like you're set, rip that thing as hard as you can. Um, yeah, we usually pull for about three seconds. How many sets are you typically doing with this? Um, it depends. I mean, like, I think if you do two, you're kind of at the point where one is like, you're used to the movement, you're switched on a little bit, but anything more, you're gonna start to get fatigued. So you'll pretty quickly see those numbers start to drop off. From okay. Like a, max effort standpoint, but. All right, let's get it. Again, it depends, like, is it a training tool, is it a testing tool? If you're training, do it all day. If you're testing, you know, get a couple good reps under your belt. So. All right, so here we go. All right, let's rip it. Come on, baby, pull, pull, pull. Whew. Nice. Sweet. Then so force trace there. Let you know things are working. Let's just, let's see where I'm at. It's been a lot of travel, it's been a big week. So just under 3,000 newtons there. Yeah, so walk me through some of these numbers here. What do we got yeah, here? Yeah, so we're looking at, these are all customizable. So a couple of the ones that I like to look at, just like peak vertical force, I change this to bilateral and then I can see what my asymmetry looks like. I think that's one of the coolest parts, that 14.5%. Yeah, so I can see you know, just which side I'm favoring in that movement. So putting a little bit more into that right side just in this particular case. Um, and then again, kind of looking at it from a peak vertical force as it relates to your body mass. So sometimes when you're testing a large group and you want to compare like who's my pound for pound, for pound strongest athlete, you can compare everything relative to an athlete's body weight, um, which is pretty cool. And then again, now kind of looking at some of maybe the more like neuromuscular standpoints. So, so like what's that. this, the 66% asymmetry there? That can't be good, right? Yeah, what's that one mean? Uh, I don't know. I mean, again, I'd like to like try to look at these as just, uh, you know, a quick snapshot of whatever that movement was. Yep. So on something like that, whether it's just start time to peak force. So maybe that's just like my first initial loading phase if I'm just putting a little bit more emphasis in the right side and the left side catches up moving in, but uh, yeah. And then do you have, because this is one of the cool things I was thinking about with that historical data where yeah. like tracks, do you have your other data in here that we can look at with the graph? I wish I did. So typically is where you'll see it on the right side here. Yep. And I just haven't really tested a lot of IMTPs, more so because I just don't have the setup. Um, but something like force plates, I'll be able to see all my historical data and then be able to look at those percentage changes from test to test. Which I think is sick, because yes. then you can tell. Even it, like, for a readiness then, it's not necessarily are they PRing, but it's like are you staying within a certain range, or are you dropping, or are you gaining in, in certain things, which sure. I think could be sick, like weekly, if you're looking at just, uh, okay, this athlete just had a 40% drop off from where they typically are. There's yeah. still a, because that's where you, like, you could go, that athlete's still stronger than all the athletes. Like they still put up a four, Wyman still put up a 4,000, but it's a thousand less than what he's been doing. Sure. Something's probably up there. 100%. Yeah, so I think from a, like a performance standpoint, and usually like if you're working with a, a team and organization, like 
easy terms to break up force plates into. I'll usually do like three buckets. I'll get you set up here too if you want to rip one. Yeah. Um, but I will look at force plates give you the ability to maybe bucket number one is like an athlete profiling standpoint, right? So it's looking at those athletic qualities. Like what are those true like athletic qualities that a force plate can show you? Uh, two would then be like the readiness monitoring side of things. So like you said, if you're testing weekly or every other week and you can start to see those percentage changes, whether that's positive or negative, right? Like in season, you want to see how much the volume's affecting it. So you want to look at a little bit more of like, are we dropping off? Are we fatigued? Neuromuscular, are we shot? But then maybe in the off season, you're hoping to see some of those adaptations, right? So. Yep. I'm all right to step on it here. Give me one sec. So I'm going to zero the plates out first. Yeah, so let's go ahead and weigh in. Two twenty sound about right. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's two nineteen point four yesterday. Perfect. All right. Yeah. So now on you here. Um, yeah. So you get your athlete profiling side of things. You get your monitoring readiness side of things, and then you know from uh, depending on the the personnel and the staff you have, more of like a return to play side of things. Yep. You've got baseline information to say this is where we're at. You know, preseason or six weeks in, something does happen. Now we can try to make more confident decisions around like when are you really good to get back out on the field. Again, trying to get some of that objective data to support your decision making. Oh yeah. All right, you want me to rip? I do. Really? How's that height for you? Where's? How's that? Yeah. That look good. Thigh. Yeah. All right. That's so cool. a little tension, load up a little bit, and then when you're ready, just give it a rip. Pull, pull, pull. There you go. Ugh. Holy. F Fuck. Oh my God. I felt like I was going to pass out there. That feels good. That's a good feeling. Oh. Damn. Nice. Dude. What do we got? So what do we got? Anything here you're seeing? What would you, if I was your first client, oh, thank click. Okay. Yeah, you're good. If you were seeing this, what would you kind of run me through? That type of thing. Well, I mean, one, it's like, it's a number that's going to show up and the most common question you get is like, is that good? Is that not good? So what's nice is that big picture, we can take this data on the back end and compare it to like normative data yep. to say like, if you are a you know, 27, 28 year old college football player or you know, professional athlete, how do you stack up? So we can show that, but 4,200 newtons of force is, is pretty powerful from a peak force standpoint. Um, asymmetry obviously looks good. That one's interesting that started that time to peak force and kind of how we both are you know the strategy that we're using to get to ultimately like that peak force production right? you said Dowdle had a really really high one or really really fast one right rate of force development yes yeah, so yeah. Down there. yeah which yours is also really high there too right it's just like how much force you're producing at the start of that movement right so almost 7,000 is uh, just means yeah neurologically right you're switched on you're firing really quickly uh, that's Impulse. What's this one? What Impulse do we got here? This is like work over time. Um, Oops, sorry. I, yeah, keep that I don't know. I, I feel like I have it on there because some coaches really like to see it. I don't really look too deeply into it. But there's some people that are crazy about Impulse right now. I just haven't really done the time to, uh, to really look into it. Well, one of the numbers, and obviously I only have the one number with Dowdle, but I thought that was cool because he is now a runner, yeah. much smaller, so it's like his overall force numbers aren't there, but Dowdle is like a freak athlete, yeah. like learns things very quickly, is just an unbelievable like quick twitch guy, yeah. kind of switched over because he's a runner. But he, even though his numbers aren't the highest on like the peak, yeah. he still had a crazy one of this, where it's yeah. like you kind of tell like, oh, that's your, that's your athlete, that's your 100%. dude. Yep, yep, especially like you look at a sport like Mark playing like football or cross his whole life where the quicker you can accelerate, decelerate, you know, burst into a new movement, you know, break on a ball, make a tackle, like all those things that Mark is great at. It's like all comes from how quickly can you turn on and get to that spot. So, um, yeah, it's one of those cool athletic qualities I like looking into. Fuck yeah. yeah Second man. set? Yeah, let's, let's do rip it. it. You're doing a belt this time? Yeah. Sweet. You doing belt? Um, I'm just going to rip it again. And well, let's get it, baby. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Over three here. Yeah, give me a three. Give me a three banger. Come on, baby. 
Come on. Oh, come on, baby. Let's go. Woo! That is that pass out feeling. Right? <laughs> I know. It feels so good, though. All right. What do I hit? It's pause or pause. stop there, and then that little dial on the left side. Left side. There it 3, is. 3,000. Let's go. That, dude. that was a billion. That was a billion pounds. Dude, that's a PR. All right, so we got an improvement there. It's not a PR, but it's my PR for today. For today, that's all that matters. Anything, what, do you remember your rate of force at the moment? Um, the 66% no. is gone. Yeah, you balanced good. out, dude. <laughs> right, which is like also the thing that you have to take with a grain of salt when you're looking at some of this data and some of this tech. It's like, it's gonna give you a snapshot of that movement, that information. And I was telling some of your guys the other day because everybody was like, oh, like, this is my asymmetry, like, does that mean this is hurt or this is hurt? I'm like, no. It's like, you're taking one, one test, one day, one time. It's like, you don't have to take that number, that asymmetry as gospel necessarily. It's just... Well, I think that's the cool thing about this is if you got dailies, yes. where it's like, yeah, one rep, you can pull totally on your right leg, yeah. or especially your first rep, let's say you have no idea what you're doing, right. and you just rip on your right leg or rip on your left leg, but... You would think with the, if you, as you get more data points, you would start to find trend lines that are exactly. telling you a little bit something about uh, what to do with it. And I feel like uh, ready to rip after uh, that first set. Like I no, want to go. It is. I it's, feel like primed. It's a great prime. Right? <laughs> it is uh, like fired up, ready to go. All right, what should we shoot here? 4,500 here? See yeah, the belt. Oh, hit? we're doing 42, I think. Okay. Um, but belt's a little experiment to see if it, uh, Pulled. I didn't feel anything. I like the mid thigh pull because it's not in that super flex position. No, I felt yeah. super strong out of that position. All right, let's get it. Oh, oh my god, dude! Holy shit! Oh, that was a. Did it feel quite as strong there? What did we get? Forty-three. Forty-three. So your last one was 42? Yeah. Nice. We got a little improvement. But we dropped off on our rate of force development. We're shot, dude. CNS is fried. There you go. We're done. That's that was the good. thing from like a true max out testing standpoint. I think you get like one to two really good looks at it. Yeah, that was nice though. And that then, feels. Uh, but that's like the, the cool piece of it too. And when people do invest in this type of system and you're, you're trying to think about like, how do I maximize it, get the most out of it? We always like to say like, some standpoint, testing is training, training is testing, right? Maybe you have a couple days you're setting aside that are gonna be more of a true, like, we are going for PR, this is the, the number that we're gonna stick with as we're looking at your trends over time, right? yep. your testing days. But then there's also, like, you can always get good feedback in a training session, too. Even if you had programmed in, we're gonna do five sets of three second max pulls. You're not necessarily looking to improve every time, but you wanna get that stimulus you're still gonna get the feedback here and be able to train with it. Well, that's the, that's the coolest thing to us. We had the athletes go, they went through one round, and then as soon as there was a number, as soon yeah. as there was a game to play, yeah. every single, oh, I'm gonna go do it, I'm gonna go do it. I'm like, dude, instantly they wanted to go, yeah. like, go pull something. Like, if you, if you don't have numbers, like, that's, that's one of the problems with a lot of those isometric pulls. It's like, if you don't have a number, if you don't have something to reach for, yeah. it's like, there's, no, there's nothing giving you any feedback. So sure. it's like, sure, you're pulling hard, but are you like, it's like timing your sprints versus not timing your sure. sprints. You know, yeah. like I think there's a big difference here. And I just saw every single one of our athletes, even the girls, were like, I want to go do that. I want to yeah. see if I can beat somebody, yeah. which I think is a really cool piece to no. this like toy. Exactly, man. I think, and sometimes like working with coaches, even if it's not at the end of the day, like the sports science side isn't their number one priority or they don't want to really like, like you were kind of saying, they want to collect the data, they want to have it. Maybe they'll make some decisions from it, but the feedback that we get a lot of the times is like, we just want to increase uh, intent and buy-in and competition and shit talk in the weight room, right? Of like, it's a, it's a valuable tool for those things too. It's always going to be there for you in the back end, but even at a starting point of saying like, we want to have some instant objective feedback. I want to be able to see it as the coach, but these athletes, they want to look at like two or three numbers on there. They want to compete with the guy next to them. And now we're getting a, a better input, output, workout. Um, I love hearing that feedback, you know, the yeah. intent piece of it is really cool. Fuck yeah. Uh, I know you have to go here. Do you want to show the down monitor or do you want to do an outro video right now? Um, 
Let's do outro. Okay. I, don't, I don't have anything groundbreaking with it other than <laughs> just like we could mess around with it. But cool. uh, yeah, let's do four it. Stacks are awesome. So that's it. That's a force play day. That's a little gapping day. You and I got a full. We, it's just for a video, so we're going to be an hour long. Yeah. We got a whole podcast in. Perfect, man. Happy to, to join your long form content. Yeah, we joined the. We joined, We started. We, you and I started the long, long form content together. <laughs> um, that was the worst thing in the world. We were trying to cut our Anatomy Tuesdays down to like a one minute oh. Instagram clip. <laughs> it's a learning experience, right? We're a learning experience. Learning experience. We should have just kept a long form. We yeah. should have just, yeah, I'm trying to get we all were, of that we information. We were ahead of time, though. Right? We were, we were. We should have. Honestly, though, if we had started YouTube then. Who knows? Who, who knows? We could Definitely be. Definitely paying rent. We could have been paying rent right now. That's, that's the goal of the YouTube, pay rent with the YouTube money. But yeah, dude, that, that was fucking dope. That was yeah. sweet. And it was uh, fun having you on, dude. Awesome, Anything man. else you got for the people? How, no, how do how, they, they want to look into this stuff? They just go to your website, what do they do? What? Yeah, check out, just check out Vald. Honestly, we, I think, pride ourselves, one, on the systems and software that we provide, but from like an education standpoint, we have a lot of really good resources out there. If people are interested in just like getting a kind of a crash course, we have a full webinars page, newsletters, you know, our research that we put into it, but um, it's all free. If you go to our webinars page, we have like leading experts from around the world. Um, Alex and Tara is obviously one of the big names in isometrics and force plates. He's got free information out there, so if you're interested in just checking it out, uh, I would encourage that. It is packed with value. Um, and then, yeah, just connect with me or anybody on our team on social media. You know, we're always like open and, and wanting to chat with people about it. But, uh, no, man, you're doing great work. Keep following along with this guy. Austin's one of the best in the business. And, uh, I don't know if I trust another trainer uh, more than this guy right here. I appreciate that. If you're in Minnesota, Welty also has these, right? Yes. So they can go bug him and yes. try him out. He's a stud. He's, and he's a nerd he's about him. Welty, you're a nerd, dude. <laughs> he is locked in. Really, really high level stuff already. So I'm excited to see what he keeps putting out. Fuck yeah, dude. Well, you have to go fit, what'd you say, a Minnesota summer in eight days here? Exactly. You're back exactly. from AZ. Yep. Yes, sir. We'll keep at it. Fuck yeah. Awesome, brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate you coming. Thanks, man. Fuck yeah. Let's go. Boom. Oh, love it, dude. Good stuff.